Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends, on behalf of Lise Grande, the president of USIP and its board of directors, I want to offer you a warm welcome to this important conversation on the future of Haiti. My name is Keith Mines. I'm vice president of, for Latin America at the Institute, and I'm joined by our co-hosts for the event, the missions of the United States in Trinidad and Tobago to the OAS. Now, the U.S. Institute of Peace was established in 1984 by members of Congress, veterans of war for the most part, whose vision was of a well-placed institute in the heart of the United States that provided both a symbol and an operational hub for U.S. efforts to build a more peaceful world. We seek to mitigate and end violent conflicts and to build on lasting conflict termination through a mix of convenings, good offices, analysis, and field programs. We have an excellent program today in which we will hear perspectives from four former special representatives of the United Nations Secretary General to Haiti, who served during a wide range of situations and conditions. Enrique Trehorst from Venezuela, who served from 1996 to 1998. Juan Gabriel Valdez from Chile, from 19, uh, 2004 to 2006. Edmund Moulet of Guatemala from 2006 to 7, and then again from 2010 to 11 and Helen Lalim from the United States from 2018 to 2022. So to open our program today, we'll hear remarks from the chair of the OAS Working Group on Haiti, Ambassador Anthony Philip Spencer of Trinidad and Tobago, who will be followed by Ambassador Leon Charles of Haiti and Ambassador Lazarus Amayo from Kenya. We'll then move to our panel. Ambassador Philip Spencer. Pleasant good afternoon, everyone. And let me begin by acknowledging the presence of my distinguished colleague, ambassadors, and permanent representatives of OES member states to the OES. Um, here, of course, present is the vice chair of the working group on Haiti. I must also acknowledge the presence of His Excellency Ambassador Lazarus Amayo, the ambassador of Kenya, to the United States here in Washington, D.C. And it's a pleasure to meet our distinguished former SRSGs. This afternoon, we've gathered to assess the situation in Haiti, inspired and instructed by the intent and mandates issued in UN Security Council Resolution 2699 of October, as well as OAS General Assembly Resolution 3007 of June 23rd, 2023. Our discussion also, understandably, must be guided by the mandates included in the recently adopted Permanent Council Resolution 1237, which we adopted just two weeks ago, but wrong, one month ago, four weeks ago, on the 17th of November. This timely consultation with key stakeholders and partners has been convened with the clear realization that Haiti is at a critical inflection point in the restoration of its security and governance. In the three resolutions adopted in 2023 at the OAS, Permanent Council Resolution 1214 in February, General Assembly Resolution 3007 in June, and again, Permanent Council Resolution 1237 in November, three key imperatives have been identified and reiterated as central for ensuring that the intention implementation gaps that the people of Haiti have experienced from past assistance measures and support missions are not repeated. These three critical requirements for delivering on building and sustaining the expectant hope that is now being reported on among Haitians at home and in the diaspora with the imminent deployment of the Kenyan-led multinational support, uh, security support mission are first, an inclusive approach. This was advanced in Resolution 1214 in, January, in February 2023. It also requires immediate action. And Resolution 3007 adopted by the OAS General Assembly made that clear. And finally, it calls for integrated assistance which was mandated in 1237, just a month ago. As international partners of Haiti 
and the Haitian people, we must now recognize very clearly that this significant moment in the security and governance of that long besieged but beautiful country calls for a careful and coherent synchronization and reconciliation of these three requirements of inclusivity, immediacy, and integrity in the support and assistance that we provide for what must still be a Haitian-led solution to their country's multidimensional crisis. The OAS Working Group on Haiti is committed to ensuring that OAS member states, permanent observers, entities, agencies, and general secretariat can consistently advance and promote each of those principles in our cooperation and collaboration with our partners and stakeholders. We are convinced that it is particularly only with the integrity in our provision of support to the people of Haiti that what we say we will do and which reflects our commitment to integrate our efforts to assist them, that the public trust and confidence, which is necessary for realizing multidimensional security and democratic governance in Haiti, will emerge. It is with this shared commitment to effectively reconciling and synchronizing the governing principles of inclusivity, immediacy, and integrity in the deployment and delivery of our support and assistance to increase security and improve governance in Haiti that we assemble today. I look forward to our purposeful reflection on the lessons learned from our previous assistance and support measures and missions. I also anticipate that our productive recommendations will inform how we can effectively reconcile and synchronize the roles of the MSS and the OAS together with other major international partners such as the Caribbean community, CARICOM. I'm therefore confident that our deliberation today will ensure that this inflection point in the restoration of security and governance in Haiti is optimized in the public interest, with the public trust, and for the good and service of the people of Haiti. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, to address you as a, as a special group. I can uh, say uh, the specialist on Haiti. And I, have, I would like to uh, congratulate the presence of the uh, former special UN representative in Haiti. I was in Haiti, uh, I was in, on, in service in Haiti in, in the 90s, when Ambassador Mullet was there, I was the chief of police in Haiti when Ambassador Valdez, that, Gabriel Valdez was there, and Ambassador Lalim two years ago. We, we had a tough time in Haiti. I hope this conference will give us Haiti the opportunity to look forward and find a solution finally. I would like uh, to extend a double thank you to the president of the USIP, Mr. Keith Miles, and Ambassador uh, um, Philip Spencer, president of the working group on Haiti at the US, and Ambassador uh, uh, Special Permanent Representative at the US, and Ambassador Francisco Mora, uh, Permanent Representative at the US, at, at the US from the US, and uh, Vice President. Of the, of the working group on Haiti. Let me continue in French. Haïti est un sujet palpitant d'intérêt à la fois pour son histoire en tant que seule nation ayant vécu l'esclavage, pour sa culture et aussi pour ses malheurs. Je ne sais pas vraiment quel aspect de la vie du pays cette sélecte assistance voudrait écouter, mais j'ai choisi d'orienter mes propos vers la conjoncture et l'avenir. Ce n'est pas un secret pour personne que, présentement, le pays subit l'assaut de gangs armés qui fait monter un calvaire à la population. C'est une situation qui, malheureusement, a plongé le pays dans une crise de sécurité jamais égalée dans son histoire. 
Les conséquences d'une telle situation sont nombreuses aujourd'hui. Haïti connaît une vague de déplacés internes sans précédent. Un nombre important de la population cherche refuge à l'étranger. La force publique est constituée de la police et des forces armées. La police est dépassée, sous-équipée et en manque d'effectifs. Les forces armées récemment mobilisées sont à l'état embryonnaire. Dans le but de résoudre la situation, le Premier ministre, son Excellence Dr Ariel Henry, a sollicité l'appui de la communauté internationale en octobre 2022 et réitéré sa demande en juin 2023 en vue d'aider le pays à sortir du bourbier. En octobre dernier, le Conseil de sécurité a voté la résolution 2699 autorisant une mission internationale d'appui à la sécurité en Haïti sous le leadership du Kenya. Je remercie la présidente de l'ambassade du Kenya en Haïti à Washington. Pardon. Cette mission est attendue incessamment dans le pays. Je salue le travail réalisé par le groupe de travail de l'OEA sur Haïti, qui, à travers des divers groupes thématiques, a considéré divers aspects de la situation d'Haïti, notamment la crise humanitaire, les questions politiques et bien sûr la sécurité. La dernière résolution sur Haïti, adoptée par le Conseil permanent de l'OEA le 17 novembre dernier, a été présentée par la présidente du groupe de travail. Cette résolution vise à fournir à Haïti une assistance intégrée en matière d'aide humanitaire, d'élection, de renforcement de la démocratie, de protection des droits de la personne et de développement intégré, en collaboration avec la mission multinationale d'appui à la sécurité et le groupe de personnalités éminentes de la CARICOM. Sans aucun doute, Haïti a grandement besoin de l'appui international pour permettre aux autorités de reprendre le contrôle de la totalité du territoire, remettre de l'ordre dans les rues et permettre à la population de vaquer librement à ses activités. Cependant, pour éviter les erreurs du passé, Haïti a besoin de miser sur l'avenir en construisant avec l'appui de la communauté internationale des forces de sécurité qui seront en mesure de garantir la sécurité de la population après le départ de la mission multinationale. Nous avons fait l'expérience des missions onusiennes en Haïti au cours des deux récentes décennies. Nous avons appris suffisamment pour savoir que sans des institutions fortes, Haïti ne pourra pas prendre la relève à l'expiration du mandat de la mission. Dans ce sens, des réflexions ont été menées par, avec la participation d'ailleurs de l'international autour du système de sécurité d'Haïti. Je veux rappeler qu'en 2015, le pays a produit son premier livre blanc sur la sécurité et la défense nationale. Ce document prévoit la mise en place d'un ensemble de structures dont le Conseil national de sécurité en vue de consolider d'une part les progrès réalisés avec la présence de la MINUSTA à l'époque et garantir l'avenir du pays. Malheureusement, la MINUSTA est partie et le livre blanc n'a pas été implémenté. Haïti a besoin d'un engagement sur le long terme pouvant l'aider à construire et à garantir la sécurité de sa population. S'agissant de sécurité, il n'est pas superflu de, de signaler que l'armée d'Haïti qui, qui a fondé cette nation joue un rôle prépondérant dans l'imaginaire collectif, dans le maintien de la sécurité. Il est vrai que le comportement historique de l'armée, notamment son implication dans les coups d'État et dans des tâches de sécurité publique, a servi de base pour son démantèlement en 1994, en lieu et place de la réforme qu'elle devait subir. Cependant, les analyses ont montré que le vide occasionné par le démantèlement de l'armée a été favorable à l'émergence des gangs armés, car la police nationale, 28 ans après sa création, n'arrive pas toute seule à maintenir la sécurité des citoyens, qui est la fonction régalienne de l'État, sans parler de la défense du territoire. Par ailleurs, non seulement le vide se fait sentir au niveau du système de sécurité, mais aussi à l'occasion des catastrophes naturelles qui frappent assez souvent le pays. Et en cette occasion spéciale offerte par l'Institut pour la paix et la présidence du groupe de travail sur Haïti, il conviendra de nous tourner vers l'avenir, avec une nouvelle approche 
fondée sur la mise en place d'institutions solides pouvant assurer l'ordre et la paix dans les rues. C'est la voie aussi à suivre pour assurer un niveau de stabilité capable de favoriser le développement du pays. Je vous remercie. Mr. Keith Mines, the Vice President of Latin America at, the U at USIP, my colleagues and friends, Ambassador Philip Spencer, Ambassador Mora, and Ambassador Leon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking Mr. Keith Mines for extending invitation to me to join you in this conversation on the important topic on matters relating to Haiti. For those we had uh, a meeting with during the last time uh, OAS permanent reps were meeting, permit me or forgive me if I repeat some of the things we had said uh, on that occasion. But uh, suffice to say that uh, we are honored to have in our midst those that have served in the region before. And we're having with us here representatives also from CARICOM and from OAS on this very topic on stabilization of Haiti. As we mentioned, during our last meeting, Kenya responded to an invitation or request of the Secretary General of the UN and also the government of Haiti for contribution towards the multinational security support to help Haiti take care of matters of law and order. We did that. And uh, subsequently, of course, requested that we need to legitimize any mission to Haiti. As a result, the United States and Ecuador sponsored a resolution at the UN Security Council, which was adopted. And so we talk of UN Security Council Resolution 2699, which um, authorizes member states to form and deploy an MSS mission with the lead country in close co cooperation and coordination with Haiti on an initial period of 12 months following the adoption of the resolution. Just to do a summary to say to provide operational support to the Asian National Police, including building its capacity through the planning and conduct of joint security support operations as it endeavors to counter gangs and improve security conditions in the country. Equally important is uh, to provide support to NHP for provision of security for critical infrastructure sites, transit locations, as airports, schools, hostels, and key intersections. Uh, when reading this one, I said they should have also included farming because farmers also need facilitation. And last but not least in this regard, to support HNP and ensure unhindered and safe access to humanitarian aid for population receiving assistance, and in general, to help HNP maintain basic law and order, public safety, including arrest and detention as necessary, and in full compliance with international law, including humanitarian human rights as applicable. Kenya accepted and we've been going on with preparations for deployment. We had our cabinet approve the deployment to Haiti. We had our National Security Council do the same and our parliament, the National Assembly also approved deployment of a thousand police officers to Haiti. We are going on with preparations is only that the dates for deployment changed because um, as a democracy, 
especially after the 2010 constitution was promulgated in Kenya, citizens are free uh, to go to courts and seek redress if they feel that there are issues of interest to them. Uh, uh, an opposition leader went to court to question whether there was full public participation or whether it is constitutional to do so. But I'm happy to inform that, yes, court processes are court processes. We are hoping for a quick outcome on the 24th of January. But much public participation has taken place even after the gentleman went to court, including approval by parliament itself. Even parliamentary discussions took place after he'd gone to court. So we hope that um, the courts will be able to dispose of the case at the earliest convenience. Um, as we also promised during our last um, meeting, that uh, we will recognize sovereignty and, and, and territorial integrity of Haiti. We'll be impartial in our operations in Haiti. Our desire is to help Haiti stay on the driving seat and deliver a Haitian solution to Haitian problems supported by friends and partners of Haiti. We have gone into consultations with many friends and we continue the exercise of engagement in preparation for deployment to Haiti. We've had of late the recent ones with the Canada, with USA, with Jamaica, we are continuing the process so that we can be able to have a robust force that goes to Haiti to make a difference to what has been there before. As usual, of course, we have also opened avenues for engagement with the civil society. We have quite a number of uh, private sector civil society organizations that have come to us as an embassy to engage with us, to express their concerns. And we promise to be a listening, a listening embassy and a listening Kenyan delegation. Because at the end of the day, what is important is a stable, peaceful, prosperous Haiti. And our role based on the UN Security Council resolution is on matters of peace and security, law and order. But you and I appreciate that the Haitian solution, Haitian problem is more than law and order. Law and order alone will not be sustainable if we don't address the other issues of, of importance too to the Haitians. Why am I saying this? As I said during the meeting with OIS, desire is to win the hearts and minds of the Asians so that we have a last, lasting peace. But we, can, we cannot do that with the guns alone. You need complementary roles to occur so that we don't operate in silos. The political process needs to go on. Political dialogue needs to go on, involving the stakeholders, leading eventually to a democratic process, free and fair, credible elections that will be acceptable to the people of Haiti. Of equal importance is the socioeconomic path. What do you do, for example, when you engage and you have a large number of people that were in the gangs, they accept to lay down their guns, what alternative do you offer them? How are they going to make their livelihood? Some, uh, and so these are issues that are important for us to address. What am I talking about? I'm saying that the several packages need to be handled almost simultaneously. We may be forced to engage, though we don't have to go that direction, on a chicken and egg business. What should come first? There are those that are looking for elections to legitimize whatever is in. But you need law and order to be able to register campaign and do the elections. 
But equally true, you need law and order for the business to thrive. And of importance, just emphasizing what I was talking about earlier, is when you win over Asians on matters of law and order, there must also be a program on social reintegration into the society so that whatever you are having is sustainable. We believe that um, Haiti requires support. The MSS mission requires support, financial, yes, material equipment and the likes, yes, but it also needs support that is predictable and sustainable. Why do I emphasize that aspect? It's because MSS mission is authorized or approved by the UN Security Council, but it's not a UN Security Council funded mission. It relies on voluntary contributions from member states and organizations. In this regard, we acknowledge with appreciation countries that have pledged support, financial support to MSS, those that are also willing to go on equipment, those that are also going on on capacity building. But this is where we need a bit more on coordination and a bit more on enhancing the provisions. So far, what has been pledged, uh, I hope it is a work in progress, but it is less than what you'd need for de even for de deployment of uh, police from the troop, I mean, the police contributing countries. I know the, their attention, major attention in the Middle East, major attention in Europe, but as OAS, Haiti is in your Western Hemisphere, and nobody will solve it without you staying on the steering wheel. Um, in our case, in Africa, we had issues in Somalia, and a number of African countries volunteered to contribute troops. And if I'm talking about Kenya's experience in peacekeeping, we have had peacekeeping operations in many countries, whether it is from Croatia to Namibia to Sierra Leone to Sudan to Somalia to Democratic Republic of Congo. We have also had those are peacekeeping missions, but we have also had missions where there is no peace to keep. So those are political missions. Like when we went to Somalia, there was no peace to keep. And so just like when we go into Haiti, all are possible. Initially, there were many discussions as to whether countries can really go into Somalia, the terrorist activities that were there, but we managed to go there. We were able to engage with the local population. Where arms were required, we used. Where we, arms, where we used negotiations, engagement, communication with the local communities, they were able to appreciate and join. And this is why roles are complementary. If you go to an, a, a region and they don't have water, like we had cases in Somalia, and you sink a borehole and they, you provide water, that wins them over. Or you have medical facilities and you're able to extend that to those that are in need. And so all I'm saying is our mandate is on peace, security, law, and order. But I think CARICOM and OIS needs to help Haiti to communicate and effectively communicate its needs, that you will not solve security in, in isolation. It has to come with the other aspects so that tomorrow, with capacity build, Haitians can be able to continue. If that is not followed, then you may end up in a situation where because the armed personnel are arriving, they come, and it's like there's an arrangement. You keep peace for a year or two, they leave, and once they have left, the situation goes back to where it was before. I don't think that is what Haiti or the Caribbean or OAS or the global community would be interested in. Kenya is committed to this cause, and as I said, we are our only reason for coming in to play our part 
is humanitarian needs and the fact that Kenya, like the African Union, considers African diaspora wherever they are to be their responsibility, they have a, hand to, a, a, a helping hand to extend. In the African Union, we have five regions. The sixth one is, is the African diaspora, wherever they are in the world. And so we consider Haiti or even the Caribbean as part of the African diaspora. And so when you in CARICOM and OAS extend as neighbors and primary stakeholders, we are able to identify with you and join you, but you remain on the, the steering wheel. The other aspect uh, that I thought perhaps is uh, worth talking about is that aspect on funding and contribution of police officers. Kenya accepted to contribute 1,000 police officers. And I'm happy that we've had a good number of countries also from the Caribbean pledging to contribute armed personnel. The numbers are still low. Even with a targeted figure of 2,500, we are not yet there. We still need almost another 1,000 to be able to reach 2,500. But looking at a population of 11 million people with 10,000 police officers registered to be in service, the ratio even by UN standards is low. But if you're looking at the actual, to be able to create that impact, I believe CARICOM, Haiti, OAS needs to appeal for more members to contribute police officers to Haiti and for more members to contribute funding to support the mission to Haiti. And the other track is to say, let us not wait for one track alone. As we handle matters of peace and security, let there be corresponding engagements to continue. I'm happy, for example, the eminent persons group, why in Haiti continue with the political process, would be glad when these efforts complement one another. But ultimately, we are looking for what would make Haiti stand on its feet and gain hope. Because when I had discussions with a number of civil society organizations, it's the question of also hope. What do you tell someone who sold part of their land or even livestock to educate their children? They finish all level education or university and there are no jobs for them. What role model will you give the younger ones to tell them, please go to school so that tomorrow, normal circumstances say, go to school so that you can be as successful as so and so. These are areas where we are saying that um, it would be important if we continue the conversation. But I must thank Yusip for convening this important forum, for bringing us together, and for the key players that are here. Uh, and in conclusion, just to say, Kenya is ready to play its part. We'll play our part with the key stakeholders. We acknowledge that the st stakeholders involved the government, the private sector, civil society, the diaspora, which is also very critical. Uh, but like any other diaspora, it gives you room to be able to reevaluate whatever you're having on course. We look forward to more engagement with the primary stakeholders on matters of Haiti so that this mission should succeed because if it fails, then we will have failed Haiti for the fifth or sixth time. And I don't think that is what we are looking for. Kenya is prepared to do its part. And uh, all we are asking is your voice to come out. Because even if you go to the social media, what brand do we hear? If you are silent, people may not be able to get the other side of the story to help them appreciate that it is doable, but doable with Asians being involved as primary stakeholders and with the Asians at the driving seat. I thank you for your attention and look forward to meeting with you again soon. I'm sorry I had to leave because of another engagement at three, but my colleague, the minister-counselor, is here. If you are to extend longer, I'll join you before you finish. Thank you very much.
I think we've, we've had a very good scene setting um, for the discussion that we now wanted to have with uh, four of our very distinguished guests, uh, former uh, special representatives of the United Nations in uh, Haiti. One of the things that I think we've heard and that we all know is that um, one hears a lot that nothing has worked in Haiti, everything has been a failure, that we're, you know, it's just never been a place with, uh, with a very productive um, uh, field for, for progress. And, and I think that all of you are going to agree that that is simply not true. You've all been involved in different uh, parts of the Haiti experience that has seen progress and there has been things that have worked, um, that have worked well uh, and that have seen, again, periods of progress. So I think what we wanted to do today was to think a little bit about um, what was the formula for when things work well, uh, what are the things that, that need to be added to this mission that is being set up. Uh, there's a couple things in play, of course, the multinational security support mission led by Kenya, and then this negotiation effort led by CARICOM uh, to strengthen the transitional government. Um, but, but in essence, this, this multinational security mission that Kenya is leading is replicating a UN mission uh, outside the UN system. So it's a very unique arrangement. Um, and I just wanted to start our conversation uh, very briefly. We'll, we'll have maybe two to three minute interventions uh, per, per, uh, per guest. And for some of these questions, I'll probably just look to one or two of you and then allow the others, if you really want, to, to come in. But we may just uh, go through these uh, quickly. But what resources and personnel and capacity did you have in the UN system that this mission will not have? Uh, and, and how do you develop that? How do you do that in a mission uh, of this kind? And then to think a little bit about what kinds of things the OAS properly resourced could generate of those things that will be uh, missing. Helen, I wonder if we could start with you. Thank you. Well, when I arrived in Haiti, Minusta had already departed, so we were much smaller. Minujust was, had already had a year of, of work in Haiti. And so I really faced having to work UN missions without all of the stuff that had accompanied the, the, larger, the larger missions that were there. And so what, what was important, what was key? It was working more closely with the Haitians and having a, a, a continuous dialogue with them about the reforms that needed to take place in Haiti. And so good work was being done in terms of the economy, in terms of humanitarian assistance, in terms of um, the political effort as well. Dialogues were launched. They weren't successful to the extent that an agreement, an all-encompassing agreement was, was achieved, and, and that was that. But I think with each effort, progress was made, and progress continues. So there's a lot of good work going on in Haiti with the government, through the government, with civil society. It needs to continue, and I think we need to understand that this is a long-term effort. And missions are important, and right now it needs to be about security and establishing the conditions so that Haitians can return to pursuing their livelihoods, as Ambassador Charles said. We've got all the principles, but we need to create the mechanisms on the ground that will allow for the kind of coordination that needs to happen with Haitians in the lead. I think that in the past, what we have tried to do, what is, and the Haitians have said it, is that we work, we substitute for them, and we haven't done enough in working in partnership. So fewer resources means that we need to focus on the coordination much more. 
coordinations with Haitians, coordinations within the donor community, and coordination with those organizations that are going to be in Haiti for the long term. And, um, and set up the work so that when the mission will leave, it doesn't all come crashing down. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Ambassador Muller? It's on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Um, well, I, I would like to echo the uh, Kenyan ambassador's words, Ambassador Lalim's also words, regarding the uh, coordination mechanism. Uh, the MSS will be um, directly involved in uh, guaranteeing uh, security on the streets and for the people of Haiti. But then you have many, many other aspects in Haiti that have to be addressed and that are not included in the mandate that was given by the uh, Security Council. And this is uh, capacity building and the uh, HNP, for example, and humanitarian assistance and development and job creation and rule of law and many, many other aspects. When uh, MINUSTA was in place, it was an integrated mission and we had the uh, cooperation, participation of all agencies, funds and programs, which is not the case now. So this uh, mechanism to coordinate all that is indispensable in order to advance in that, in that direction. Um, uh, with the UN missions, we had, uh, I would say, enough resources in order to achieve all this, which is now lacking. So an enormous effort has to be done also in looking for these resources. And you have the contributions of many uh, stakeholders that, that can specialize in different aspects. Uh, the uh, capacity building of the uh, and Pay, uh, PNH was done thanks to the contributions of countries like Chile and Spain and France and Canada and the United States. And they built the uh, facilities and they trained. And all that was really, right, right now it's almost lost. Uh, it was really unfortunate and I'd like to take the opportunity to say again, as I've said many, many times, it was really unfortunate that the uh, Trump administration decided to cut the funding for uh, the missions in, in Haiti. The long-term commitment is indispensable, is important. We've had five, six uh, peacekeeping missions in Haiti over the years, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. And without a long-term commitment, we will not achieve anything. So this is a unique opportunity right now to learn from lessons of past missions. And that commitment should be there in the very long, long term. And to have a division of labor of many stakeholders and many aspects for the development of, of Haiti. Thank you very much. Ambassador Baldez. Yes. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. It's a pleasure to see here some persons that I admire very much for what they have done in Haiti, particularly my friend at Montmule. And uh, it's a pleasure to be at this institution that works so, uh, with gives such importance to, to the country or love, and uh, uh, at the same time, we feel uh, extraordinary uh, sorrow for what the situation that is going on th through right now. I would say that uh, what we, what when I came to Haiti, the situation of the government was extremely weak. There was, uh, after the expulsion of Aristide, there was uh, a council of Sage, Conseil de Sage, that had elected a prime minister. I have to say that one positive thing was that Lavalas was defeated in the situ in, the, in that in that moment who had participated in in the Conseil de Sage and therefore the person who was elected at least had uh, a certain relationship with those who had been defeated in the process in the political process. This was important because there was a request from some parts of society to eliminate Lavalas from the political system, which was absurd at the time from my point of view. And uh, the, the, the communications that both us as MINUSTA and the American Embassy in, in, in Haiti maintained was to keep open the doors to communication with all political sectors in the country. 
Now, uh, but I, what I wanted to stress is that the political system was extremely weak. Uh, the, 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 they had no resources. They were in the middle of a situation in which uh, confrontations had happened very seriously during the period of Aristide. Therefore, what I thought was extremely important at the time was to understand exactly what the Haitians wanted. And in that sense, the, the idea of, uh, and I, I read here one of the questions that, that the, the, they wanted to pose to us, the relation between security and politics. The relation between security and politics was to uh, understand and to respect what Haitians were thinking. Because what is political in, that, in, 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 in this context? Political is uh, that when you have a position of power, like Minusta had at that moment, it controlled not just uh, the security of the country, it had thousands of soldiers distributed in different parts of the nation. It had the helicopters to move authorities through the country. It had the security to allow them to move inside Puerto Príncipe, Puerto Prince. It had uh, the possibility of talking to some and not talking to others. Therefore, uh, in that sense, the, the attitude had to be to uh, understand exactly what were the motivations and the interests of people inside Haiti in the, in the political system and in order to respect what was respectable and at the same time to indicate what was unacceptable. And this I think that was a very important part of the first part of the mission. We came there without intelligence. The other question is what, what, we, what we missed was intelligence. There was no intelligence in the mission. And this was, a re, this was a result of a debate inside the United Nations on the Brahimi report, because the Brahimi report recommended the need for, the, for, for intelligence in the mission, but the mission had no system of intelligence. We had to create one, and in that sense, I follow what uh, 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 it has just been said. The point is, um, Spaniards, Spanish policemen, for instance, were extremely important in the creation of a system of security in Minusta. But I go right now up to, to, to end this, this intervention, I, this first intervention, I was just, uh, I want to say that the most important thing that the UN gave us as a mission was a clear structure of authority, of who took the decisions who was responsible for the decisions. This is very important, and I think that in this new exercise of foreign presence in support of the police of Haiti, it, is, it has to be extremely clear who makes the decisions, who is responsible for these decisions, and who has the ultimate authority on the Kenyan uh, 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 policeman who will be supporting the country and the recuperation of law and order. I think that this was given perfectly well by the UN. To be very frank, I'm not clear exactly how it will happen now. This is, a, I think, a, an important question. Thank you very much. Can I follow up just real quick? Because we that, that did go into the other question about the, it was the chicken and egg question that, that our, our ambassador from, from Kenya mentioned as well. The question of politics and security, Ambassador Valdez, what what is the r relationship between a capable Haitian government uh, that is transparent and has popular support and the the, the MSS the, the the security mission is can you, can you have one without the other? I don't think you can have uh, one be, be, uh, without the other. I think that from my point of view, at the time in which we were in Haiti and. Uh, I think in that sense there is a clear distinction between what the, the mission that my friend Mon Mule had and the one I had. There, was, there were different moments in the history of the country. Because when we came and we were asked by the elites of the country to repress uh, in a, a clear uh, military way uh, with force, using the authority we had, 
um, the groups that were controlling, for instance, Cite Soleil, and uh, the groups that were creating violence in Cite Soleil, the hesitation we had was because we thought that these people, and a, part, a very important part of the Haitian people, did not see the government that was at, the, at that time as a legitimate government. Because they had been appointed without an election, and they, they were waiting for an election. Therefore, if we proceeded to act with violence, the reaction was, the reaction of most people was, you are foreigners acting with violence in a situation, I mean, even, if you're, if you, even if you're allowed by, by the, UN, the UN, but the point is that the, the only country that has, the, the only possibility of reestablishing order in this country is with a legitimate government, a legitimate Haitian authority that will say, yes, you have to surrender your weapons. You have to disarm, you have to, be, you have to leave this, the, the activities you are carrying on now. Therefore, the elections became to us a very important, uh, an essential thing. And uh, I have to say that we were not supported necessarily by the Haitian elites at that time. That they didn't want the elections, particularly when they realized who would win the elections. Therefore, the relationship between security and, uh, and, and, political, and political development is, is essential. Political legitimacy is essential. Now, you have to act at the same time, even if the government is not legitimate. I'm not saying that you shouldn't act in, 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 in the situation of insecurity that the country is having now, for instance. Uh, but it is clear that you will be much more, you will be really successful if you have behind, or you have along with, with, the, with, the, with the mission, with the foreign mission, a government that supports you, a government that is respected and is seen by, as legitimate by the population. I think this was a very, uh, I, this is a lesson I got, and I think it is an important thing to mention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ambassador Trehorsk, can we go back to the first question again? And that was to consider the things, you were there at a very <clears throat> time when there was a very robust mission. Um, you had a political section, you had civil affairs, you had judicial assistance, all this. So what, as you think about a mission coming in now, a bi binational mission that's built out of kind of a coalition of the willing, what are the things that you would, would, would suggest that they develop that they just have to have, that, that, that may not be part of the, the natural mandate, but they would need to have from somewhere? Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, not only did we have at that time a very robust mission, as you call it, uh, it had a very large military component, it had a large uh, police component, and we had also MCV, which was a human rights operation managed mainly by the OAS, and which was of critical importance because it was MCV who was in contact with the people who got information, who was the face that helped and was showed solidarity with those that had been mistreated by the police forces. Uh, the new uh, mission, this multinational mission, and I would like to thank uh, the ambassador of, of uh, Kenya particularly for uh, this very important step that his country has taken in coming to the help of, of Haiti. And uh, obviously the government of Kenya has already reflected also quite deeply about what is necessary and has not adopted the very restrictive uh, definition of security, but uh, I think uh, your statement, Mr. Ambassador, shows very clearly that uh, security is a multifaceted thing. Uh, and I think uh, as of the moment that you are deployed, uh, I think you should have an additional support by probably a stronger human rights element, wherever it is located, either with the UN or with the new OAS operation, uh, that will, will I think, uh, prove uh, very productive also for, for the military presence that Kenya will be providing. 
Um, second, I think uh, it might be a good thing that uh, you still have 1,500 officers to be really uh, provided by other contributing countries. And uh, I think you could, uh, as government of Kenya, probably uh, inform these, these contributing countries what type of specialty you would particularly appreciate. Huh? There is crowd control, there is criminal investigation, there is protection of infrastructure, there is rapid reaction forces that might be necessary. I don't know how you are setting up your own contribution, but I think you have to look at the, at the whole spectrum of police activity, some of them verging uh, on almost military intervention, given that the situation you will be facing is much more difficult than when the one we faced in 96, 97, when by this massive presence of, of uh, Minua at that time, the sole presence probably was enough to, to scare uh, the wits out of uh, anyone who intended to do anything uh, against the law. Security was there, and we were profiting from that presence, and I have to say, also probably from an overflow of uh, the law and order in inverted commas that sometimes is incompatible with democracy, that was f flowing over still from the time of the Duvalier uh, dictatorship. That has disappeared. This uh, situation that you will be facing is one of armed anarchy, if one can define it in any way. And that requires uh, a presence. It, it requires authority. It requires teamwork. And it requires the Haitians themselves who agree among each other. I have never seen the capacity that Haitians have to fight each other. That, I think, is something that has to be uh, addressed, and we have to see how one can turn this uh, urgency this incredible emergency that uh, the country is face facing uh, and to really organize a transition in which additional absorptive capacity is created. Uh, if the absorptive capacity of Haiti was low at the time when things were going better, well, it's, it's even lower now. Huh? The, what we have been witnessing over the last five decades is the slow but steady dismantling, first of the state and now of society. So the task that is in front of us is enormous, much, much more difficult than whatever any one of us sitting here had to deal with. And... Uh, uh, I think, uh, summing up, a uh, stronger MCV, a rapid reaction force, and for the future, how do you turn this present support and this present generosity that has been elicited by Kenya and which is shaming others now into participating as well, uh, how does one turn that into long-term support? And there, I think we have to think of a, of a long-term uh, objective that has to be turned into reality as quickly as possible. And that is to establish what could be called a national development corporation built 
upon a mixture of peacekeeping operations and models that we have in most of our countries that follow or are similar to the Tennessee Valley Authority, regional development corporations that continue working come hell or high water. It doesn't matter which of the donors has an election and cannot extend <clears throat> the mandate of whatever. There are no mandates. This is a 25 to 30 year operation in which the priorities have been established by the Haitians, where uh, the main projects as well uh, have been agreed to, where one can start with the projects that have been approved by previous governments, where no legitimacy issues have arisen, uh, but have been stopped because of the lack of resources or any other reason. I think uh, I spoke yesterday to a friend in Haiti. He told me there must be at least 400 projects that have been stopped for that reason. I mean, and, and an operation of this type, let's call it for short, the Tennessee Valley uh, imitation operation, can start work with two or three large contributing countries, following also the model, model that has been established outside of the United Nations by the Syria Recovery Trust Fund, which was initiated by Germany, the US, and Qatar, I think it was. And then, with time, additional countries joined, and they have their replenishment exercises, and uh, it, it's an operation that functions very well. I think uh, there would be interest in looking at the structure of this uh, Syria Recovery Trust Fund. And it was been brought up, it was established by AID and the KFW of Germany, back practically. It takes on board <clears throat> much of the administrative and legal structure of uh, KFW uh, promoted and financed uh, projects. KFW was the German bank that was established with the resources of the Marshall Plan immediately after the Second World War. It is today the third largest bank in Germany, finances all type of uh, projects, and has a particular expertise in governance uh, as uh, it, uh, it, it, it started by identifying bottlenecks for the effective uh, and efficient management of, of a state, which was the German state at that time. It, can, I'm going I'm to have to move on, but... Yes. I'm glad you planted that because I wanted to get to that. You've actually jumped ahead. So you, we've covered two questions in one. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. But thank you for that. And I, I just want to say Enrique has a white paper on that that we're happy to distribute. It's actually a very interesting idea. And it, it is that there is a big question about the generation of resources, again, in parallel to the political and security issues and the economic development in the private sector. There is just a simple question of generating the resources for what is now a, a huge rebuilding task. So thank you for planning that, and I, I won't have to get to that uh, later. We're going to, we're a few minutes over, we're going to go just a few more minutes, uh, and then we're going to have some time uh, in a private session later to develop some of these ideas further. I wanted to hit um, uh, two other issues. One was the issue of gangs, the most immediate thing that this force will uh, confront is gangs. All of you worked at different times when the gangs were in a different place, and some easier, some harder. But Ambassador uh, Mullah, I, I wanted to just see if you could uh, discuss a little bit about the the gang strategy that you employed and, and that you've also, you're also familiar with uh, from Central America and other places that you've been active and, and again, what this mission should consider that they would need to most effectively um, bring the gangs under control. And I don't say to fight them because I think fighting them is probably not going to be something anyone will be able to do with the, a small force. But what are the tools that you would, you would look for that would be effective in, in helping to, to bring the gangs under control? 
When I when I came to Haiti, of course, I was very well informed about the uh, gang activities and uh, the kidnappings and uh, the terror imposed on the population and uh, uh, people paying ransom and uh, uh, extortion and uh, robberies, etc., and the violence. But what I was really not aware until I got to Haiti was the uh, the level of uh, madness of the, of the gang members regarding uh, uh, sexual assaults and sexual violence and rapes. Uh, and that really struck me, uh, really. And, um, and I, w I would visit these uh, a congregation of Spanish nuns in the heart of Cité Soleil, and they have a little school and they have a clinic there. And they would share with me their experiences of treating these young, young girls who were raped in a, such a violent, vicious, vicious way. And uh, I came to the conclusion that many of these gang members should not be really sent to jails or prisons, but really to psychiatric wards, because they were really completely uh, demented in, in many ways. And uh, the, the suffering and the pain they really wanted to inflict in, on their victims, on young girls. I mean, there are no surgeries, no operations, nothing will correct that. And many, many lives were, were, lost, were, were lost like that. So I'm very happy that the Security Council has a special mention of this issue for the MSS uh, regarding sexual violence and, and abuses, because this is an aspect that probably we're not, we were not prepared to, to really address in, in, in many ways. And it's a very complex one. So I hope that uh, we will have the contribution of uh, specialists on, on, on this matter with and support of, of the MSS also and other stakeholders on, on this. Um, the, uh, the, as I said before, the deterrent presence on the ground is extremely important. When the, the United States decided to cut the funding for MINUSTA, or for the UN mission in Haiti, I pleaded with the administration, okay, fine, you can get rid of the military if you wish, but do not completely uh, deplete the mission of any uh, uniform personnel. If you want to keep some uh, police uh, uh, contingents there is very important. The sole fact that they're patrolling, that they have a presence in the country, that is really uh, an important uh, deterrent, which was, which was lost. So I think that the, um, in order to uh, face this uh, violence, uh, uh, the gang instilled terror on, on the population. I'm afraid that 1,000 troops will not be enough. So I do hope that other countries will come in and provide these additional 1,500 uh, in order to have them deployed in, in key areas. Um, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very, very difficult. And uh, at our time, it was mainly Port-au-Prince and some urban areas, uh, but now it's the entire country. The entire country is in the hands of these groups, and uh, they will resist. They will resist this presence, and they will react in many ways. So, uh, and that's why I was uh, mentioning the uh, the coordination mechanism that Ambassador Lalim mentioned. Also, is extremely important because uh, security issues. Uh, providing security and patrolling and combating the uh, the gangs is, is not enough. You need humanitarian assistance. You need help. You need to uh, provide food and water. Uh, one of the problems I faced was the, uh, even though it was an integrated mission, uh, United Nations funds programs and agencies were very reluctant to be seen working alongside military forces because of the famous humanitarian space. And uh, I needed their support in many ways to, uh, for them to provide uh, humanitarian assistance at the same time as we were conducting these uh, security operations. I think that UNESCO finally gave me 50 footballs, uh, and that was it. That was it. It was thanks to the government of Norway that provided us with cash and money that we were able to uh, install some uh, uh, 
uh, soup kitchens and, and buy food and water and rice and sugar and flour to provide to the population alongside our operations in order for the people to see that there's a difference because they depend from these gangs and the structures of the gangs who provide all this basic support to the, to the population in the areas they control. So I think that it, it's important that it's not only a security operation, it's a multifaceted one. It needs the assistance of many stakeholders on all the aspects that we have, we have mentioned before. Um, it's not going to be easy, but there's a unique opportunity right now. This is a new model that's been uh, established, and I think we have to make the best of it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Let, let me do one more question, Ellen, if you, if you don't mind. I wanted to ask about the, uh, the role of the private sector in, in uh, generating, again, some of the, the, the resources, the jobs that will be needed to pick up some of the slack that will that'll help to stabilize the country, and just from your experience. Um, in Haiti, where, where do you see that, uh, the possibilities with the private sector, and how does one do that? Thank you. Um, I'd like to pick up on a couple of things that were said. <laughs> sure, thank you. Uh, because, first of all, we really have to take a different approach this time around. It, there are, with regard, for example, to victim assistance that we just spoke about, there is a human rights presence through the UN there on the ground. And what we need to do is to work in a more sustainable uh, way. Take what is already there in Haiti, and there is coordination going on within the UN. I mean, after all, you have the Secretary General's reform that has focused on one UN. You have a UN mission that is still working, and, if, and even more so in an integrated manner, with the UN agencies that are present in country. We have to do things differently. And when it comes to, uh, to bringing a force into the country, we need to remember that SEA, the sexual exploitation and abuse issue with regard to troops. We need to focus very seriously on prevention, and we need to have very strong measures in place so that when there are abuses, victims are assisted at a level that they need, and that disciplinary action is taken against the abusers. So it's not as if with the departure of the big peacekeeping operations, all these other efforts dried up completely. They are much weaker, but they are there. And yes, 1,000 Kenyan troops, but we also have 9,000 HNP. It has to be an integrated effort with the Haitian police in order to address this issue of sustainability. And when we bring resources in, maybe we, it needs to happen more modestly than before because everything will, is always underfunded in Haiti. But we also need to demand of the Haitian government that they put skin in the game with regard to resources so that when we leave, it, the effort continues. The private sector has a role, yes. The work in the communities, they can provide jobs to these, to these gang leaders that, and gang, gang members, to people who are looking for a way to earn a living and have a decent life. A private sector that works transparently, a private sector that is serious about meeting its fiscal responsibilities, a private sector that understands that corruption needs to stop, that private sector has a very important role to play in the development of Haiti. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. We're going to close with one final very quick round, a lightning round, if you will. And I just wanted to ask each of you, starting with Ambassador Valdez, what's the one thing you wish you had known before you went to Haiti the first time? Um, allow me to say one thing about the gangs, uh, because I think it's important. I, I fear that there is a change in the nature of the gangs that we faced at the time in which we were there. The, the, the gangs today, and I have, I have never seen that before, have a political discourse they didn't have before. There are even gang leaders who see themselves as the leaders of the first Haitian revolution, and that consider that the elites have prevented the country from developing. Second, there is a reaction of the population in, in, in front of the gangs, which is extremely important. I think that the Kenyan uh, forces will be helped by the population if they manage to 
motivate this indignation, fury the, that, that the population feels towards the, the, the criminal groups. I think this is, a, this is an asset and it has to be worked very uh, seriously. I feel extremely encouraged by the way in which uh, the Kenyan ambassador reflected on their, on, their, on their responsibilities and on the way in which they are looking at the mission. And the question that I didn't know when I was outside the country and I got to learn there is a, is a, is a, is a very serious problem that I think that has been changed, has been changing recently, but was the relationship between the elites and the gangs, which is something that we cannot look uh, as it, it didn't exist. In fact, the reactions that the US government and the Canadian government have had, had recently in putting uh, people uh, out of, uh, without visas and punishing them for different, uh, in different ways, reflects or rea is a reaction towards this problem. I think that the civil society has many organizations, particularly the women organization, are extremely important in Haiti. In Haiti. And I think that the um, business sector has, as uh, Ambassador Lalina has just, Lima has just said, have groups of people who understand perfectly well what should be their role in terms of fighting the corruption and confronting violence and, uh, uh, and working in, in coordination with other groups in society. But there is still a group that resists that. And this is a problem in, in society that we have to face. Thank you very much. Enrique, same question. What do you wish you'd known? You knew a lot when you got there, but what, did you, what, what didn't you know? What do you wish you'd known? The time that uh, uh, I, I arrived in Haiti was so different from what is now that uh, just by, uh, I was well briefed in New York. Um, I knew it was a difficult task, but uh, that the resources were there. Um, I would have wished uh, better coordination within the UN system. Um, but in the end, I think uh, it turned out to be a collegiate uh, working relationship. Uh, um, yes. Uh, Really, that, that's all I have to say, quite Thanks. frankly. Thanks. Ambassador Mule. What, uh, what I didn't know uh, when I arrived in Haiti was, and I learned that very, very soon, is that there are many groups and individuals and segments of Haitian society who do not want to change, that are benefiting by the, by the current situation of corruption, of drug trafficking, of uh, well, the state not working, paying, uh, uh, they don't pay taxes, they are against the rule of law. All this is benefiting many sectors. So in order to, to really achieve something, uh, we have to work with uh, many groups and with the media also and, and with civil society in order to uh, bring all these groups, groups together. I had many, many experiences with different groups and, and with the private sector regarding rule of law, for example, and they were not interested at all. They were interested at all. Uh, uh, a tax reform system, we were trying to, to push in order for the state to have enough resources and not depend uh, on international uh, aid and assistance to pay even basic salaries. Uh, people were reluctant to, to do that. So there's a, a culture uh, and groups were bene benefiting from this. We, uh, just a few days after I arrived, we, we made a big, big mistake. One of our patrols stopped a car that belonged to uh, a member of Congress, to a deputy. And he, of course, had immunity, but Minusta soldiers who stopped that, stopped that car didn't know that. And upon opening the trunk, it was full of cocaine, full of drugs. And this deputy once was transporting drugs from one side to another side of the country. 
and uh, enormous protests from uh, the legislative branch and from Congress uh, because we had, you know, violated this uh, congressman's immunity. And when uh, the uh, government of Uruguay uh, gave to the mission these uh, speed boats and patrol boats, uh, President Prival, I must say, asked me not to deploy them in the southern part of the country, around Jacmel. Please do not do that, because certain senators from the south, uh, we know who they are, were very much opposed to having that kind of uh, verification or uh, eyes on, on the area. So uh, the, the issue of uh, corruption, of drug trafficking, of impunity, these issues are ingrained in Haiti, and somehow we have to, 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 to work with them and, and convince them. Uh, the United States uh, imposed sanctions and withdrew visas to many of them, but uh, they, they wore that as, as a badge of honor uh, instead of really being something that would convince them to do otherwise. So that was something I was not aware of, and that was really uh, something uh, I had to deal with, uh, with, I'm, I'm afraid to say, and sorry to say, with no, no results. Thank you very much. Helen, final, final words. Yeah, I think... Um one thing I didn't appreciate was the degree and the level of suffering of so much of the Haitian population. And I think my colleagues have said the same thing in, in different words. It, I didn't realize that until I got there and I saw it with my own eyes. And also the, the work of so many who are there working alongside to try to alleviate the situation, people in the medical field, the, 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 the commitment that they have to Haiti and to working with the population and to working with communities and building community networks is something I didn't appreciate and truly is magnificent. And in many ways, it started in Haiti. So thank you. Thank you. Well, that, that concludes our, our session. We've got a few minutes over. I hope that's OK. Um, you know, as we were choosing, as we were putting together the advertisement for the event, uh, the public advertisement, we were looking for a photo. And one of the <clears throat> members of our team, Stephanie Ayala, very skillfully found a, a very nice picture of two police officers in their office with a map of Haiti behind them. And I, I said, you know, we're going to use this one. We, you know, the other options are burning tires and people running through the streets. And, you know, Haitians have told me, look, it, those are real pictures. They've happened, but it's not the daily life of Haiti. The daily life of Haiti is millions of people trying to help pull the country together. So anyway, I was very pleased with that, that picture for our event today. And I hope we've, we've both reflected honestly on the challenges, but also just reminded ourselves, while there's a lot to do, there's a lot to work with. And I hope that we can uh, collectively find the means to give Haiti this new opportunity and this time to make it stick. Thank you very much for joining us today.